In fact, recession in my timeline is right on schedule for June, July of this year. Uh, don't, don't, you know, it's not written on a tablet from Mount Sinai. I'm just saying that, and I'm going to go through that in a second. That's the time frame when I see the reverse repo facility runs dry, when the banking crisis intensifies, when the real Fed funds rate, which has been positive around 2% for 12 months, always leads to recession. That's when the inverted yield curve, which is, good, which is the most inverted for the most amount of time ever, is is gonna is gonna be in effect? Um, and there's some some other factors too that all point me to the fact that this summer, late spring, early summer, will be a next liquidity crisis. Powell goes back into all those things I just mentioned, and if he does so, because he'll have no choice, guess what? There's a great chance the odds are elevated, Andy, that we're gonna see long-term interest rates rise. Not full. Hey, Michael, how you doing? Uh, good, Andy. How are you? Nice doing to well. meet you. Thank you nice so much for your program. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for coming up on board. Um, a few things I really want to talk about, and there's plenty of to talk about, but probably what I appreciate most about you is your perspective or your take on this tug of war, if you would, of deflation and inflation. I find that quite interesting um, because what you're hearing or what we're hearing most of in the mainstream media is we're in this inflationary cycle, which, yes, that's true. But if you are put a gun to my head and see where we're headed or even where we're at, I would say we're actually in a deflationary cycle. Give me your thoughts on all that and where we're at. And, uh, where we're going in regards to inflation and deflation. I mean, unfortunately, the first question you've asked me, I could uh, expound on for about three hours. I'm going to try to truncate that as best I can. So let's get let's just get some definitions uh, in place first, um, Andy. Uh, inflation, the way I, I think of inflation, is when the market loses confidence in a currency's purchasing power. And that's usually engendered from the fact that the central bank over-monetizes government debt and just prints a bunch of fiat currency. And that leads to this pervasive and protracted, uh, intractable loss of confidence in a currency's purchasing power. That's, that's inflation. Um, disinflation is when the second derivative of inflation is falling. And that's where I think we, we have been in for a while. So the government says we're growing at a 9% inflationary rate back in the summer uh, and of two years ago. And then that just inflated all the way to 3%. That's where we are right now. Now we're in a, actually in a period of stasis where we, we seem to be struggling to get that last mile of disinflation back to the Fed's asinine, as I love to say, asinine 2% target. Because why in the world would a central bank have a target for inflation that's anything but zero? Should be zero. We, the, that should be their responsibility. Let's link the money supply growth, the base money supply growth. Let's peg it towards GDP growth, which is population growth plus or labor force growth plus a productivity. And then it, in that, if that paradigm is consistent, you will never have any hyperinflationary breakouts. You won't have any disinflationary or deflationary busts. It'll be mostly, for the most part, a period of calm and uh, prosperity. So um, I agree with you that we could be heading for a period of deflation, which is absolute and uh, nominal falling prices. Um, so the rate of change of inflation would be negative, not just falling, not, not just rising at a slower rate. Um, that would be engendered from, again, uh, I believe, a, a deflationary depression or recession, which is normally the, out, the outcome of that. Um, and that comes from a liquidity crisis. And that's where I think we are eventually headed. Uh, the reason why we're not there right now is because the Fed's refo re reverse repo facility had two and a half trillion dollars, which was just taking reserves and high powered money out of the financial system, parking it at the Fed that just le leaves it there and pays interest on it. That money has been pouring out two trillion dollars have been pouring out over the last year or so. That is more than offset quantitative tightening. Um and uh, if I could just get into why I believe that's important. So I look at the Treasury General account, reverse repo facility, bank lending standards, and I look at um, 
the base, the monetary base. What I do, these are what I look at when determining liquidity. And the reverse repo facility has offset quantitative tightening by the tune to a, of about a half a trillion dollars this past year. So we actually have had quantitative easing in the past year. And that's why you say, you know, the stock market rallying, you see, you know, not only uh, shitcoin or Bitcoin, as I like to call it, that's going through the roof. And, and again, I shouldn't have said that because now I'm, I have to explain. I actually like the idea of cryptocurrencies. I like the idea of getting away from the fiat currency system, but blockchains are unlimited. There's unlimited number of cryptocurrencies. Uh, they are no longer a transaction that's anonymous or immutable or decentralized. Wall Street has co-opted and corrupted it. And that's why you see one unit trading uh, at $70,000, a bunch of letters and numbers. Electronic letters and numbers shouldn't be worth $70,000 a unit, a glorified QR code. Um, but Bitcoin in its purest form, you know, a way to transact illicitly, anonymously over the internet has a purpose, but it's in 70,000. I am so sorry for that long answer to that first question. And I'm going to shut No, that's up. fine. No, that's fine. And uh, th there's a lot said there that I'm packing in. I really agree. Um, you're speaking my love language, really. Um, I would agree with you because it seems like all of this policy, if you would, it's like almost like they're pulling a lever here, pushing down a lever here, and they're working. One is inflationary. And a lever is inflationary, who would, and then another lever is deflationary. I think there is a, a fly in the ointment, if you would, and that is really the banking, the banking problem. So last year, about this time, you had a regional bank. Regional banks were under a lot of pressure. Well, under pressures, underselling it, they were going. They were going belly up. Um, there was a run on the banks, if you would. Um, the Fed more or less bailed them out or the treasury bailed them out. That is starting to hit now. I had a guest on about three weeks ago and the bank term funding program ended on the 11th of March. And his thesis was, well, Andy, I don't know what's going to happen. And yes, I don't know what's going to happen either. All I know is this is a crunch on liquidity now. And this is really negative on the banking sector, which would be negative on the overall U.S. economy. What are your thoughts now on that? So I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear. Who, who are you saying that this person, some person said it was a, a, a liquidity squeeze? Who was that person? His name is Bob uh, Moriarty. He's um, uh, the owner of 321 Gold. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, I happen to be, I mean, I've been talking about this for a long time. March 11, uh, 2023 was when those three banks went belly up, those regional banks, and they came with this bank term funding program, which was really uh, acted like, I called it QE light um, because, and the only reason why it was QE light is because it had an expiration date of a year. Uh, <laughs> and um, I mean, but it was, it was QE. They, they, the Fed said, okay, you have this commercial mortgage backed security. You have this mortgage backed security. You have this corporate bond. You have this treasury um, that's way underwater. It's maybe set 70 cents on the dollar. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come and I'll give you a hundred cents of the dollar. I'll monetize that with, but when base money supply, Fed credit, I'll give you that. You take that and you can make loans with that. You can buy stocks with that. You can buy bonds with that. You can do anything you want with that. You can convert that to cash if you want to, because base money supply, Fed credit can be, can be converted into physical coins and currency at will by the banking system. So you do what you want to do that. I'll take your bad asset. I'll hold it on my balance sheet, but I'm going to hold it for a year and I'm going to charge you a little bit of interest. And hopefully by that time, inflation will plunge. I'll lower my interest rates to the point where your, you know, the 10 year treasury that you bought at 0.5% will once again yield 0.5%. <laughs> and, and then you won't have this hole in your balance sheet and we'll, you know, we'll start all over again. We're going to be wonderful. Well, the funny thing happened on the way to that. Well, Powell, will give, I'll give him a little bit of credit other than be a sycophant for the banking system, like every other central banker other than Paul Volcker. Um, I give him a little bit of credit that he actually ended on March 11th, the bank term funding program. So now uh, all those loans that were a year old are, are, are now returned. So you, you have to give the Fed 100 cents on the dollar plus interest, and you get your bonds back, regional banks. That's what hash, hash. <laughs> which, which, by the way, I, I will, will hasten to add, um, I think you just said it, is uh, when the, their assets are now worse in worse condition 
than they were when the Fed first took them off the bank's balance sheets. So that's a blow to liquidity, big blow to liquidity. Uh, but to, to Powell's credit, credit, he did it. Let's see how long that lasts. Um, I think he's going to have to go back into another round of QE, go back to ZERP. I think he's going to have to shake hands with Janet Yellen and launch another iteration of helicopter money. Uh, all those things he's going to have to do on the next recession. Recessions haven't been banned. Uh, in fact, the recession in my timeline is right on schedule for June, July of this year. Uh, don't, don't, you know, it's not written on a tablet from Mount Sinai. I'm just saying that, and I'm going to go through that in a second. That's the time frame when I see the reverse repo facility runs dry, when the banking crisis intensifies, when the real Fed funds rate which has been positive around 2% for 12 months, always leads to recession. That's when the inverted yield curve, which is, gonna, which is the most inverted for the most amount of time ever, is, is going gonna, is gonna to be in effect. Um, and there's some, some other factors too that will point me to the fact that this summer, late spring, early summer, will be a next liquidity crisis. Powell goes back into all those things I just mentioned. And if he does so, because they'll have no choice, guess what? There's a great chance, the odds are elevated, Andy, that we're going to see long-term interest rates rise, not fall, as they've done every other time since 1987. Because the Fed hasn't, hasn't vanquished inflation. Right. Record high inflation is still salient, forefront, forefront in the minds of consumers. Remember I told you what inflation really is. It is the loss of faith in a currency's purchasing power, which is engendered from an increase in its supply. And that's exactly what the Fed has done. They took the, they took the Fed's balance sheet from $700 billion in 2007 to $9 trillion of high-powered money. That'll do it. That'll do the trick. And then when you shake hands with Janet Jan Yellen and launch helicopter money and hand people checks to stay home and consume stuff that isn't being produced, you destroy the faith in the currency is purchasing power. So if that's the case, long-term rates rise, they don't fall. That's been the salve of every recession since the dawn of time. It's like the Fed comes in since 1913, since the Fed was enacted. Um, they come in, they print money, they take long-term interest rates down, and that solves the borrowing problem. Because it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem of liquidity, it's a problem of leverage, it's a problem of debt default. And they, they fix the issue by taking the interest rates down. Uh, that might not work next time. Okay, so if long-term interest rates do rise, and, and I want to preface this as where I'm, I'm really agreeing with you, and I, but I want to disagree. Um, and I'm saying that is I'm trying to game this out, but where are the holes here? If long-term interest rates rise, people's portfolio, a bond portfolio, is going to get hammered. As well as, as well as the stock portfolio, because borrowing costs are going to be much higher. The investors, or I don't know, funds or traders like yourself, or money managers like yourself, you're going to see it costs more to borrow money for companies to borrow money. So, what I'm trying to say is, why would they, why would they buy the short end? short end of the curve, the Fed, if you would, if it's going to create inflation when they're trying to bring on deflation. Does that make sense? So I think you lost me at the last part of it. Um, so, <laughs> so why would they, so the, it, so the short-term interest rates compete with um, Fed funds and the Fed funds are yeah. control. They, they, so it's the, that's part of the money market. Right. Uh, so the, so Fed funds, and T-bills are part of the money market. Right. And they trade tandem with each other. So the Fed controls Fed funds. They, can, they flood the, the overnight repo facility, over, uh, overnight uh, intra-bank intra lending facility. Uh, that's how, you know, how Fed funds get lowered is the Fed prints a bunch of money and hands it to the right. bank. And now it, it brings down the cost of overnight intra-bank lending. That's right. how it happens. So, I mean, if I can go out and get a T-bill that's yielding 1% when the Fed funds rate is zero, I mean... That's a no brand. It just doesn't work. Those, yeah. those, two, those two things flow together. So 
long-term rates will drop. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Short-term rates will plunge if the Fed lowers interest rates from five and a quarter to five and a half down to zero. But it's the long-term rates that could rise because long-term rates are a function of how much, what's your deficits, what's your debt, and what's the inflation rate. That's right, because the of the risk. Concern. This is what they're most concerned about. And because you've broken the back of deflation or disinflation, you've inculcated to the market. Remember what I told you about what causes re what really leads to inflation. Well, people are going to say, wait a second. I know what happened. I've seen this before. The Fed comes in, monetizes a tremendous amount of debt. It leads to a tremendous amount of inflation. And I am not going to pay 5% uh, for a, or 4.5% for a 30 year long bond or zero coupon bond when I know inflation is going to be 10%. Right. That's how you're going to get, that's, that, that's the way I think that, that functions. That, that's the way that's going to function. Okay. How is this going to play out in two markets? The, the banking sector, obviously, how are banks making any money, right? And how are they going to make any money? And then the real estate market then, um, I'm going to give you an example of the real estate market. If the long-term rate is rising, I mean, well, here's my real world example. This is anecdotal. I have a family. We're looking to upgrade our house here, but I have a, my mortgage rate is about 3%. And I'm going to be quoted at five, six, 7% in the future. It just seems like that would just destroy the real estate market then. Why would I, why not just stay pat? Does that make sense? Of, of course. So I, I think the real estate market is going to melt down. Um, it could drop by 30% again. And not because we have these crazy loans out there. It, it's just because prices are, are so unhinged. So the home price, I look at the home price to income ratio when I look at home prices. It's 5.5 right now, according to the data that I just went through. So median home price compared to median family income. In, in the peak, it was 2000, in, in the peak of uh, 2005, it was five times. And so for reference, in the year 2000, it was 2.8. Okay. So home prices have never been more un unaffordable. And buying a home right now is 50% more expensive than just being a renter. So pr the previous peak of that venture <laughs> was, was 33%. Before the before uh, the global financial crisis, two thousand eight, um, and when you throw in home ownership uh, payments like taxes and insurance, it's a it's a record percent of the median household income. So home just, homes are just completely unaffordable. But here's a caveat: the underwriting standards have been much better. There is now skin in the game. I hear that all the time, and that's. That is correct. There's no more liar loans, ninja loans, blah, blah, blah. Although in many cases, instead of putting zero down, they're putting down 2% <laughs> for a GSE loan. So um, FHA is your loan. So uh, here's, how I, here's how, where I think this is going is to happen briefly. Just, just, um, I'll, I'll shorten this as much as I possibly can. Once the unemployment rate begins to rise, and it always spikes during recessions, then the people who own four and five houses, because 25% of home purchases have been for investors, be it Blackstone or, you know, mom and pop who went out and got loans for almost nothing and bought a bunch, you know, bunch of single family homes and rented them out. And they're up, you know, 40 or 100% on those home purchases, the value of those homes is up in the last three or four years. And the calculation is, wait, wait a second. It makes a lot of sense, Andy to hold on to your four houses or five houses when I'm getting income and the home price is appreciating. When the income stream stops because the, the renter loses his job and then home prices begin to roll over because once homes stop going up and they start to fall, it feeds on itself because there's a panic now. I'm not getting the liquidity for my investment and I want to cash out you know, you can only live in one home at one at one time. And if I'm up 100% on five houses in the last few years, and it's the case down here where, where I'm in Florida, 100% increase in some of these country clubs down here mm -hmm. in the last, since COVID. So, you know, in the last few years. Uh, 
the calculation is it's no longer making me any money, no longer getting that cash flow. I'm getting out before they go down. And you could have a cascade of homes on the market, huge supply of homes hit the market once the recession hits and home prices drop 30%. That's where they should be because they're not affordable. The Fed, in its, in its omniscience and in their goal to help the poor in the middle, you know, the poor in the middle of class has made it unaffordable for first time home buyers to get a house. Congratulations. Yeah. Hope you're proud of yourself. Hope you're, hope. Oh, wait a second. Did, you really don't care about the poor middle class. You're there for one reason, to protect banks. Wall Street has always take, taken precedence over Main Street, as far as the Fed's concerned. And don't let anybody tell you any differently. I mean, why the heck? Yeah, Andy, they raised their, they, the Fed, raised their projection, their, their, their uh, summary of economic projections, raised the rate of inflation, raised the GDP forecast. Um, it, it, commodities are spiking. Uh, credit spreads are razor thin. Uh, stock market is at an all time high. Uh, unemployment is, you know, very quiescent. Non farm uh, payrolls are surprised to the upside practically every month before they get revised lower. At least the establishment survey. We can get in, we can get into the household survey if you want to. But all the data says, hey, you know, things are going great. But the Fed still has three rate cuts this year. And the reason is because they know they're panicked of what's going to happen with the banking system. They understand what's happening in the banking system. They're, they're not surprised by that. The effective Fed funds rate was 4.6% in March when they first launched uh, the bank term funding program. Now it's 5.3%. Ten-year note was 3.5%. Now it's 4.3%. The 30-year mortgage was 6.6%. Today it's 7%. So right. well, the banks are going to the, the, the regional banking index, not my imagination, go look it up, KRE, shows it's down 40% in the last couple of years. It tells you the problems in the banking system are real. That's going to, the potential for a liquidity crisis and deflation and a recession starting in June or July of this year. And that's when the, and that's when the, uh, that's when you'll see the credit markets freeze, the home prices begin to drop and the market's going to tumble. The more, the more absolutely tumble. Right. So let's skim this out um, somewhat, if you would. Let's say if our, our thesis is true, and I believe it to be true, uh, where is one to hide, if you would? And I, I, and I am, for the record, I think deflation is very uh, underrated, meaning we should have deflation in a free market system, which we don't have. We should have a deflation just because it punishes overconsumption or it punishes people with uh, their over leveraged and that sort of thing. But it seems like we've been kicking the can down so far that it only gets more extreme. But that, that's a whole other topic, I guess. My question is: is like, how do we game this out? Let's say that um, everything gets hammered, and the obvious answer is gold or silver, precious metals. But I'm looking back and I remember 2008. Everything got hammered in a deflationary cycle. Yeah, um, everything, goes, everything goes to a correlation of one. You're correct. Can I just say something? And I do apologize for interrupting please. you. You're very kind, not in interrupting me, as I do my, my rambling of answers. Uh, but um, I, I don't think the goal should be to punish anybody. Um, I think the goal should be to help people. And the goal to help this country, the goal to help also, in the long run, is you're correct. It's deflation. You need to bring home prices down 30%. You need right. to stock price. Stock prices are forty percent overvalued. Right. That's just to get. Well, let's just talk about the stock, the equity market. To get the total value of equities back into line with the underlying economy, so the, the total market cap of equities as a percentage of GDP, back to a hundred percent, so they both would equal each other. It would take a forty percent plunge in the stock market, and a hundred percent is actually a very rich valuation. It should be closer to seventy-five or eighty, historically speaking. We're at one hundred and eighty-five percent now, Andy. Yeah, it's nuts. So, I mean, deflation and debt default, I guess, would teach people a lesson—not to punish them, but to teach them a lesson. The free market is part of the free market is failure, creative destruction. Joseph Schumpeter, not my, my not my uh, theory; it's his theory. Creative destruction. Allow 
insolvent companies to fail. 45% of the Russell 2000 companies don't make any money. This is why the recession is coming. You know, I think I started the, I hope this isn't a tangent, but the recession is coming. It, it usually takes one year. Now, this has happened in 2008. The Fed, the Fed funds rate went from 3% in 2003 to five and a quarter in 2006. A year later, the stock market topped out and that led a year after that to the global financial crisis. Well, the Fed stopped raising rates when? At five and a quarter to five and a half percent. July of 23, a year later. Yeah. That's where you get number two. It's right on time. And, and why? Well, so, so we have, the consumer has more floating rate debt today than they did in the global financial crisis. They have less debt today as a percentage of GDP. They have more debt, but less debt as a percentage of the economy. More of that debt is floating rate debt. And that's why for the first time in, in any Fed rate hiking cycle, consumers have lost. Net income has gone down. Usually net income goes up in aggregate for the household because households have a lot of fixed, fixed rate debt. They have a lot of mortgage debt. Most households, even in, even in 2008, it was a lot of people didn't have a mortgage or if they had a mortgage, it was fixed and they didn't care. But now there's credit card debt and auto loan debt and, and floating rate debt of all kinds, personal loans, uh, home equity loans, all floating rate debt that's getting refinanced at higher and higher rates all the time. And Take the money out of the system. Yeah. And that's why you're seeing consumer default rates spike in, yeah. across the board. Yeah. And corporations refinanced, they, they went out and refinanced their debt in 2020. But that maturity wall is hitting in 24 and 25. Well, we're at 24 and 25. And they're refinancing at much higher rates. So it's a big race. It's a gamble. I'm not going to, I'm a corporation. I'm not going to refinance my debt. Powell tell me he's going to lower rates. I'm going to lower rates. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And you know what's going to happen? He's not going to be able to cut rates very much because inflation is not going to let him. Right. Maybe, Maybe he cuts two or three times this year. So what? So it's 4.75 4. to 5%. That's not going to save the regional banking index. It's not going to save the Russell 2000. Because they were borrowing money at zero, at next to zero, like, you know, 2, 3%. Now they got to borrow money at 7, 8%. Right. It doesn't work for them. Yeah. And if long term rates rise, in my theory, it actually is going to hurt them. Significantly. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it's right on schedule. Everybody take a breath. I heard today on, on uh, Bloomberg, um, you know, no, none of the bears are calling for a recession. I am. I think the recession is coming. I think it's on time. Uh, it's going to be very cathartic. It's going to be healthy if it's allowed to happen. Just be a little more patient. Got it. So then that begs the question, and I know you got to leave here, but um, that begs the question, where do you oh, hide yes, out? I didn't, I, didn't answer your question. I didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. You're right. I, 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 okay. okay. So <laughs> everything goes to a correlation of one. So what do you own? So this is sector one of my five spectrum inflation, deflation spectrum. Sector one is deflation, outright deflation. And there are, there's intensities to each sector, but so it's not, it's not hyperinflation, it's not inflation, it's not stasis, it's not disinflation, it's deflation. Well, everything goes to a correlation in one. So you want cash, you want U.S. government debt, you want to own the U.S. dollar, and you want to short the stock market. Now, I am not short the stock market at this time, and I am not long the U.S. dollar any longer. I made a lot, I did very well for me and my clients with that one trade, U.S. dollar. We were long, we were long it for two years. We sold it a few months ago. Um, I, I think the dollar will strengthen in a liquidity crisis. It always does it in the past because you're just unwinding. Some guy, some guy calls it a milkshake theory. I, I just call it an unwind of a carry trade. You know, you borrow dollars, you invest overseas, the global liquidity crisis happens. You have to get out of that carry trade. You sell your, your, your yen. You, you, I, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, you sell your you know, Brazilian real, whatever, and then you buy back your, your, your dollars. So it's just a repatriation of the, of the carry trade, which drives the dollar higher, obviously. Um, 
and, and even the yen. These people, why does the yen strengthen in, in a time of global liquidity crisis? Well, because people borrow in yen and they invest overseas around the world. And then when they have to close out those trades, they have to buy back the yen. It's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a close out or a carry trade. It's not a new idea. It's, I've, had, I've had this theory for, for you know, decades now. I've been in the business 33 years. So, um, so everything goes in correlation to one. Not time to do it yet, but my model will, will, God willing, and hopefully tell me when I need to sell my longs, get out of your foreign investments. We have a, we have a big allocation to foreign stocks right now. Um, we're in physical gold. We've got 10% physical gold, and we have, even have a little bit in the miners. None of those things will work when we have, if you're like me, are worried about a strong, intense deflationary cycle. Because everybody wants one thing. They want dollars. They want liquidity and they want dollars. We're not there yet. We're, I might be heading there. I plan on I plan on making money for my clients, God willing, when that happens. Because if we're if you own, if you have cash, and if you own short duration US treasuries, you don't have to go T bills, but you can go, you know, out one to three years. Um, and you short the market, you, you could make make a lot of money while the chaos happens. You just gotta get, get the timing right. Yeah. Got it. Well, Michael, I know you got to run. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciated. If you could give a shout out where people can uh, reach you at. And if they're interested in your services, uh, give your contact info. So the website is pentoporch.com. There's a uh, trial subscription there. Five weeks of something I call the midweek reality check. I give you all the data that you really should be getting. Like, uh, for instance, instead of hearing how wonderful the non-farm payroll report is on uh, the establishment survey, you might want to hear what's going on with the household survey, which has been shedding jobs for the past three months and always leads the establishment survey. So those are the kind of, kind of, the kind of stuff you should really be paying attention to. It's a five-week free trial. If you like the trial, $50 a year, you can get access to uh, not only the data that you need, but also some high-level thoughts on where we are in the macroeconomic uh, uh, construction of the uh, economy, global economy, especially the G3, which is China, Europe, and the United States. And if you have $100,000 to invest and you are a U.S. citizen, I will invest the money myself for you in the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle model. Excellent. Well, again, I want to thank you so much for your time and uh, love to have you again on again soon. Thank you, Andy. Pleasure to uh, be with you. Absolutely.